So thank you very much for all of you who've been attending for the whole semester. Um, and I'll hold, hand you over to Christina now. Hi everybody, welcome to this last talk of the, of the semester and um, it's my huge pleasure to introduce Ronan Eldan who's going to talk about localization and concentration of measures on the discrete hypercube with applications to interacting particle systems. So I think everybody knows how the um, chat function works by now so if you would like to ask questions please ask them in the chat and I'll either interrupt Ronan or we'll take them at the end. So this um, seminar is slightly unusual in that it's going to be two hours um, so we're going to take a break in the middle of about 10 minutes um, and I guess that might be an opportunity to ask some of those questions in the middle but I'm going to hand it over to Ronan and um, take it away. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. It's great to see all those uh, familiar faces and also new faces. Uh, so let me begin. There's uh, not too much background I need to give because our, the setting is going to be uh, pretty simple. We're going to be talking uh, about the discrete hypercube. So everything in this talk is basically going to be discrete. Let's call, let's give it a name. Let's call it C sub N. And mu is going to be the uniform measure on the discrete hypercube. And throughout the talk, we'll always have some other probability measure, nu. So nu is going to be some arbitrary probability measure. And the goal of the talk is to try to find uh, nice, sufficient conditions for the measure nu to satisfy some nice properties that have to do with the first part is going to be about concentration of measure and the second part is going to be about decomposition into pure states. So let's start with concentration. And In order to illustrate what kind of results we might expect, let's start with a case that's familiar to many of us and is arguably much simpler, which is the Gaussian setting. So Rn, equipped with the standard Gaussian measure, which we denote by gamma. And here's a fact I guess many of you already know. If I have some measure nu on Rn, which is defined by d nu is e to the sum potential v d gamma, so it's absolutely continuous with respect to gamma with this density. And the Hessian of V at every point X is dominated in the positive definite sense by a mat matrix which is strictly smaller than the identity. Sorry. For all X. In this case, the measure nu satisfies some nice concentration properties. For example, for every Lipschitz function phi, we have that the variance with respect to nu of phi is at most one. This is maybe the simplest type of concentration you might expect. But then we have some stronger types of concentration. For example, we have a so-called Poincaré inequality. So again, for every test fund function phi, we can bound the variance with respect to nu phi without the Lipschitz condition by the so-called uh, Dirichlet form which is in this case, oh, sorry, it's not one here, it's one over delta. It's one with, for the Gaussian, but here 
if delta is zero, we can, cannot really say, say much. We have one over delta here. So here we have again this one over delta, but instead of the Lipschitz condition, we can write here the expectation of the gradient square of phi with respect to nu. So this is a Poincare inequality. And then we have even stronger inequalities. We have log Sabalev. And we have, uh, as a result, sub-exponential concentration for Lipschitz function. So sub-exponential tails for one Lipschitz, sub-Gaussian, sorry. Also sub-exponential. So we have, have all sorts of, of these, you know, nice concentration properties, which are useful. They have many, many applications. And motivated by this, our main question here is going to be, well, we want to take this uh, fact and find analogous bounds on the discrete hypercube. Okay. So if I want to find uh, theorem analogous to this, I first need to find the correct notions of several, uh, of, of several of these things such that, such as, for example, what, what is a Lipschitz function on the discrete, discrete hypercube? It's not clear what's, as, what's going to be the correct Dirichlet form to consider. And it's definitely not clear what this concavity assumption, what's a natural counterpart to this, okay? So in our case, uh, so let, let's first think about the, what Lipschitz might mean. So we all know the notion of a discrete derivative of a function phi on the discrete hypercube. So we just define that the partial derivative of phi in, in the ith coordinate at x is going to be just phi of x1. We force the ith coordinate to be one. And just look at the discrete difference with respect to the ith coordinate. And uh, it's gonna be nice to have this normalization over two, doesn't matter that much. And now that we have partial derivatives, we can also define the gradient of a function as just the vector of partial derivatives. And then we have a natural notion for what a Lipschitz function is. It's just going to be the usual Hamming Lipschitz condition. So lip of phi is just going to be the maximum over both x and i of the absolute value of the partial derivative. Okay. So we arguably have the correct notion for, or some notion for what Lipschitz means. This also, we, we, we have the discrete gradient, so this also gives us a notion of what 
this dirish lay form on the right hand side of the Poincare inequality is, right? But, well, I, I want to argue that this notion written here is not as natural when we think about the discrete hypercube. So maybe let me write this as a, an exclamation. So it turns out that if we just look at the expected gradient square of a test function, this is not a Dirichlet form associated with any natural Markov chain. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to skip the exact definition of what it means to be the Dirichlet form of the Markov chain because it's not going to matter that much for this talk, but I am going to say that there is a more natural notion of what one might expect to see on the right-hand side of the Poincaré inequality in the case of the discrete hypercube. And for this, we have to remind ourselves what the Glauber dynamics Markov chain is. So, you know, the discrete hypercube is just, uh, we have either plus or minus one in every coordinate. For every measure on the discrete hypercube, I can think of the following dynamics. In every time step, I uniformly choose a coordinate, and then I choose the value of the, uh, the, value of the configuration at this coordinate according to the measure conditioned on all the other coordinates. Okay, so this is called the Glauber dynamics. There is, so basically, this gives rise to the following uh, transition kernel. So the probability to go from a state X to a state Y, from a point X in, in CN to a point Y in CN, is just going to be one over N times the indicator that the two points are neighbors in the discrete hypercube. And then here I'm going to have just uh, the measure at Y, over the sum of measures at x and y. So if you think about it a little bit, this, is exact, this exactly gives rise to the process I described before. Choose a coordinate, condition on all the other coordinates, and, and then just look at the conditioned measure and toggle the point according to it. And it turns out by, uh, so basically by elementary abstract nonsense that if we have a Poincaré inequality with respect to the Dirichlet form which arises from this, so maybe let me now write what the Dirichlet form that arises is. So if I'm going to define this quadratic form of function on test functions by this formula. Then a Poincaré inequality of the form
of this form, maybe I'll put this little new here just to, so we remember that this form is associated with the measure new. Ronan, Imply there's phi yes. missing from your Dirichlet form. Sorry? Are there some phi's missing from your Dirichlet form? Oh, I just stopped writing the formula in the middle. Thanks. Sorry about that. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, if we look at the expected gradient square, it'll be almost the same thing, but instead of, we just won't have, we'll only have this new of x here. We won't have this, these other terms. Okay, so this Poincare inequality is going to imply that the Glauber dynamics Maybe let me not be precise. It's just going to imply some bounds on how how quickly the Glauber dynamics mixes. Okay, so if we go back here, we'd like to hopefully replace this by the Dirichlet form I just defined, okay? Good. So, sorry, so, so we understand what's the correct notion for this or a notion for this. We, have at least some inspiration of what the notion here should be, but we still don't know what this notion of convexity is going to be for functions on, for potentials on the discrete hypercube. Okay, first, I mean, it's clear that it's pointless to, to take just a, a convex function and restrict it to the discrete hypercube because any function on the discrete hypercube is some convex function restricted to the hypercube. So this notion is just pointless. So let's try to understand what is a useful notion, okay? And what we'll start by is, we'll start by noticing that if, well, if V of X is a quadratic form in the Gaussian case, then this measure is just another Gaussian, right? And then, you know, the measure nu inherits all the properties that the Gaussian has and this, and then it's also kind of clear why this needs to be smaller than the identity. If it's bigger than, than the identity and it's quadratic, then, you know, this, this will not even converge. Its integral will be infinity, okay? So in, in our end, the case of quadratic potentials is pretty easy to understand. But on the discrete hypercubes, it's a whole different story. And the first thing we're going to discuss is just the case of quadratic potential. So d nu in this case is just going to be of the form e to the one half, one half doesn't matter so much, x sum interaction matrix j. Okay, for some matrix j and for some vector h. So this thing has a name, it's called an Ising model. Okay, so here some results are known, and and basically most that's known for just general potentials of this form is under something called the Dubrushin uniqueness condition.
So if we define, there is a natural definition of the influence on the i-th coordinate of the i-th coordinate on the j-th coordinate, which is just the maximum over all x and y who are neighbors in the hypercube of the total variation distance between the probability of the i-th coordinate with respect to new conditioned on all the other coordinates being equal to x and the probability of the same thing conditioned on the other coordinates being equal to y. So somehow this is a matrix which tells me, you know, if I change one coordinate by how much the forces acting on the other coordinates change and There, there are theorems by several people. De Bruyne was the first one to prove something in this direction, uh, which basically says that if, if the L infinity to L infinity norm of A is strictly smaller than one, then we get some concentration. Your expression doesn't seem to depend on J. So it's not very hard to see that the entries of A can be bounded by a function of the entries of J. Okay. Um, I mean, if you have A, I, J, and then only I appears on the right-hand side. Sorry, I'm, am I missing something? So, so AIJ AI depends, of course, on the matrix J and the vector H, right? But the little j doesn't seem to appear anywhere. Ah, hold on, hold on. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, um, of course. This is J. Ah, cool. Sorry, Thank you. <laughs> it's uh, my awful handwriting. Sorry about it. Uh, yeah, so uh, let, let, let me not say precisely what this, there's a bunch of theorems due to uh, De Bruyne, Schlossmann, and then later, uh, Ceci, Martin, uh, Struk, and Zagorlinski. And others which, the gist of all of them are basically under a condition like this, you get some nice concentration properties, which also imply, for example, mixing of the Glauber dynamics. Uh, but, okay. But if we go back to the Gaussian case here, the Gaussian case suggests that it might be the case that if the operator norm of V is small, which basically means that if the operator norm of the matrix J is smaller than a constant, then we should expect some concentration. On the other hand, the De Bruyne condition is much stronger in the sense that, well, the De Bruyne condition is more or less equivalent or maybe, okay, may, may, maybe let me just write operator norm here. It's an even, it's an even weaker condition. It's more or less equivalent, not exactly, but it's not very hard to write what this means in the case of an Ising model. It's more or less equivalent to the fact 
that if you take the absolute values of the interaction matrix Jij, so if we define Wij as the absolute value of Jij, then the operator norm of the matrix W needs to be at most uh, a constant. I, mean, I, I think even like at most one or if I write one, it's not an equivalence, but it's at least there is an implication this way. However, if the operator norm of J without the absolute values is at most one, it does not mean at all that the operator norm of W will also be order one. And the good example to consider is the so-called uh, Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. In which case we take Jij to be equal to some positive constant beta times an n zero one over n random variable, which basically says that, I mean, up to symmetry, which doesn't matter, we can always symmetrize. It basically says that this matrix is just a GOE matrix. In this case, it's not hard to check that there's basically a factor of root n between the operator norm of j and the operator norm of w. So in this case, the operator norm of w is of order root n, whereas the operator norm of j is of order one. Okay, so the Bruchin's condition is just useless here. And the question to ask is, is there anything we can still do? So here's one breakthrough by Bauer, Schmidt, and Bodino, pretty recent, very short and beautiful proof. What they show is basically that if the operator norm of J is less than one, or maybe, maybe let me just write it like this. Uh, okay, we just have the following inequality. If we look at the operator norm of J, one minus the operator norm of j, the variance of a test function is at most. And on the right-hand side, I have the Dirichlet form, but in a sense, the wrong one, just the expectation of the gradient square of phi. In fact, they prove something stronger. This is a Poincaré inequality. They prove the analogous log Sobolev inequality. And they do it in a more general setting, but I don't want to, you know, burden you with entropies and stuff like that. It doesn't matter so much for this talk. So they do prove something stronger than this, but what they prove does not seem to imply anything for the Glauber dynamics, in, at least not in a straightforward way or in a way that we could uh, figure out how to do something with. So this leads, uh, leads us to a theorem together with uh, Keller and Zaytuni.
So, well, the theorem is just, you do have a Poincaré inequality, but this time with respect to the usual uh, Dirichlet form. So, And let me see, I wrote, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's what we get. And this implies, for example, that the Sherrington, the Glauber dynamics mixes on the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model in high enough temperature. So if beta is less than one over four, then uh, Glauber dynamics mixes on the SK model. Okay, that's that's one result. Any questions so far? So so far we. Yeah. Sorry, one thing that came up was just the question of whether you also get the log Sobolev inequality from Degrisian's condition. Uh, no. So we're, I mean, we believe one can get log Sobolev, what, but we haven't really, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say something about the proof and then it'll be clear where the problem is, but we can't quite get log Sobolev. Thanks. Uh, Okay, and now let's go back here to the motivation of the Gaussian case. Good, so we said something about quadratic potentials, but what about general convexity? What's a convex function, right, on the discrete hypercube? And is there a notion of convexity, or in other words, of log concavity that implies some concentration? So this is the question we want to ask now. So B, let's call this general log concavity. So here's one notion I'd like to suggest. And for this notion, I need to recall one definition, which is uh, the multilinear extension of a function on the discrete hypercube. So if I have a function f from the discrete hypercube to r, I can always write in a unique way f of x as the sum over all subsets of my coordinate set with some coefficient that depends on the subset times the characteristic function, which is just the multilinear monomial corresponding to the subset. and missing, thanks. Okay, so this is called multilinear extension. It's also called sometimes uh, discrete Fourier decomposition. It's not very hard to see. This is unique. And the point of this in, in, for us is that, you know, given a function that's only given to us on the, on the corners of, of the discrete hypercube, it now gives us an extension into the convex hull. So, so th this gives an arguably natural extension of F from Cn to the convex hull of Cn.
And now here's a definition. Our definition of what log concavity is, we say that a measure nu is, let's say, a beta semi log concave if the Hessian of log of the harmonic extension of the density of nu is at most in the positive definite sense, beta times the identity uh, on the continuous hypercube. Okay, so arguably this is, I don't know, could be a natural notion to consider saying that, you know, if you extend it inside, it can't be like, too convex if you check, for example, you know, if, if you take just two atoms at the all minus one and the all plus one points, you'll see that you get something that's very, very far from being semi-log concave, because in the middle you will have something that completely breaks. And if you get something, and if you take things which are more tamed, they will be, tend to be semi-log concave. And this is a theorem with Omer Shamir, which basically gives, which basically says that semi-log concave measures admit concentration, but in the like weakest form one can imagine. The only thing we could manage to prove is the following thing. So there exists some sequence delta n converging to zero such that if nu is one over delta n semi-log concave, and you have a one Lipschitz test, test function phi, then the variance with respect to nu of this test function, well, a trivial bound is that, maybe let me put the square root here, a trivial bound, the, the oscillation of a Lipschitz function is at most n. So clearly you have, this is at most n, but we managed to get also a delta n that goes to zero here, okay? Um, we also have an application for this, but I see that I'm not doing so well on time. So I'll skip the application uh, for now, but let me just remark that there's a related notion of log concavity. So related notion due to uh, four people, so uh, Anari, Liu, Oveskan, this is one person, even though there's a dash here, and uh, Vincent, And they do something like this. They think about, so if nu is a measure on subsets of the numbers one to n, which is like a measure on the discrete hypercube. It's just easier to write it this way. Uh, then we define the characteristic polynomial of the measure as just the sum over subsets of the coordinates of mu of a times the product i in a x i. It looks kind of like the harmonic extension. I mean, it's 
it's actually not very different up to like it's it's the same up to transformations but in their notion the all one's direction has a special role whereas in our notion there is no direction everything is invariant to reflections uh and they say that they basically prove that if p of x is log concave not semi log concave but strictly log concave on the whole positive octant then you have some nice concentration ah sorry and you also need the measure to be supported on sets of the same size Then you have a spectral gap or a Poincaré inequality with a, how, how did, what just happened? Sorry, 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 okay. Okay. Uh, so those two are somewhat related, but somehow their notion is, is much more rigid, but it also, implies more and our notion is like th th their notion is much more al algebraic in a sense our notion is more analytic i mean in order for a polynomial to be log concave it's not hard to see that it has to be basic it, it can only so so this polynomial is harmonic so you know it's tra the, the hessian is traceless which means that if it's log concave it means you can only have one direction in which it's convex and the, all the other directions have to be concave. And this is kind of a more uh, rigid requirement than ours. Okay. So this is uh, the second result. And this is all I have to say about the theorems uh, in, about concentration. And now let me talk a little bit about so about the compositions or localization so i'll tell you about two theorems which will seemingly be not very uh related to what i told you about so far but in the second hour of the talk we'll see that they're actually very related okay uh any questions so far though okay uh so here's uh a simple motivation for the kind of results we're looking for Let's consider the so-called uh, Kiri-Weiss model. So d nu is just going to be e to the one over n sum over i and j of x i times x j d mu. And sorry, let me also put some inverse temperature beta here. Okay, so I, I just have a basically a rank one quadratic form. Okay, and, and an easy fact is the following. If beta is kind of small, this looks, this is very, a spectral gap of what operator? Ah, so a spectral gap here, the spectral gap is, is basically a Poincaré inequality with, with respect to the Glauber dynamics. So the same kind of spectral gap that we had uh, above. Okay. Uh, so here is a kind of an easy, at least well-known fact. If beta is small enough, then mu is a high temperature in the sense that 
it's actually pretty close to a product measure. The correlation, make, the correlation between coordinates is very small. But if, if beta is bigger than some constant, then we basically have two so-called pure states. So if beta is larger than, I don't actually remember what number, probably two or something, or maybe one, doesn't matter so much, then we can write the measure new as a superposition or a mixture of two measures. So one half, let's call it new plus plus one half new minus, where the, the, the ideology is that the sum of spins makes, so, so the system makes basically a global decision. It decides if the sum of spins is going to be very big or very small, but up to this decision, inside every such measure, we're going to see something that's very close to a product measure. So, so that new plus and new minus, and intentionally I'm being very informal here, are I'm just going to say are close to product measures. Okay, so far this is just a motivation. And this is a motivation for us to try to find general sufficient conditions for a measure so that I can write a decomposition like that into hopefully not so many, into a mixture of hopefully not so many measures, such that each of them is in a sense localized. And you can replace the word localized by close to product or by concentrated. Those things tend to come together, but now let's try to be a, a little, a bit more formal. So given new, uh, maybe let's write this as a question. When can we write that new is a mixture sum of positive coefficients ai times new i, i goes between one and n, with n not too large, and by not too large, let's think of the, the weakest non-trivial thing possible for now. N is just, let's say, is just going to be e to the little o of little n. If n is two to the n, then I can always write a decomposition into atoms, so this is not given me much. And, where for most i, and by most I mean in the sense of the mass that these AIs contribute, new i is localized. And now let's try to interpret what localized might mean. So maybe the weakest thing we can think of, which is usually what physicists think of when they say that the measure decomposes into pure states is the following. So if X and Y are independently distributed according to new I, let's take X dot Y, this is a random variable that's somewhere between minus n and n. And if I look at the variant, at the, maybe the standard deviation of this, I just want something non-trivial. I want this to be little o of n instead of, you know, o of n, okay? So this is a one sense of localization. 
a slightly stronger sense is maybe to require that the covariance matrix of nu i is in a positive definite sense at most something like little o of n times the identity. And then we, we have an even stronger sense, maybe we can, re, we can try to require that nu i is close to some product measure, so maybe there exists a product measure, an actual product measure, xi, such that uh, maybe the KL divergence between nu i and xi is little o of n or something like that. Okay? So these are some types of uh, decompositions we could hope for. And one motivation for such decompositions is, which I'm not gonna expand about, is that they imply uh, the so-called mean field approximation bound. So, maybe just for experts. So L1 and L2 imply mean field approximation for the case of easing models. There is a very nice argument due to Jane, Keller, and Risteski that shows how to do that. And L3 implies mean field approximation in general. And this is an argument, I, th I think the first one is due to Chatterjee and Dembo. Okay, so now let me mention uh, just two theorems in this direction and then I think uh, it'll be a good time for a break. So the first theorem is, is the following. Uh, so this is uh, from 19. Uh, it turns out that to get a decomposition with L1 and N2, and L1 and L2, you don't need to, re to require any condition on your measure. In general, you can get this. So this was known before this theorem that I'm going to write. I'm going to give credits in a second. But I think this, this theorem is probably the, one of the most general results in this direction. So for every uh, probability measure mu, and every positive definite matrix L, there exists a decomposition of the following form. So I can write new as an integral. So instead of the sum here, I'm going to replace the sum by an integral. And then we're going to interpret this n being small in a slightly different way. So new is going to be an integral of new sum, sub theta d m of theta. So some mixture of measures. Uh, so that our way to interpret n being small is just to say that for most theta, the entropy of new sub theta is close to the entropy of new. Okay, so intuitively it kind of says that, you know, this mixture cannot contain just many, many atoms. It has to contain a small number of measures close to new. So what we have is that the entropy of new 
minus the expectation over theta of the entropy of nu sub theta is at most log of the determinant of identity plus the covariance of nu times the matrix L. We'll interpret this in a second. And the second thing is going to be, the second thing is going to say basically for most theta, the covariance matrix is kind of small. So the expectation again over theta distributed according to M of the covariance matrix of new theta is dominated in the positive definite sense by this matrix L to the minus one. So basically we have a trade-off. We can ensure that most, uh, that most measures in the decomposition have a small covariance matrix and we're paying by losing more entropy. So if L is big, we lose a lot of entropy, but we ensure something about the covariances. Okay. And uh, let me just mention that this generalizes. So in fact, this, this uh, theorem is true over any measure on Rn. Doesn't have to be a measure on the discrete hypercube. And it generalizes results due to Raghavendra and Tan. And due to uh, Koja Ogan and uh, Perkins. And there's a very nice idea by uh, Jane Keller and Ristesky that shows that such bound implies a mean field approximation. For Ising models. Okay, I think there is, this is probably a good time for a break. Yeah, so I'm going to suggest that we break until uh, 10 past. Um, but if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask now, maybe we can um, just do that quickly. So if anybody has a question, either please raise your hand or um, type in the chat. So Jean-Christophe has a question. Maybe I'll unmute him um, if I can find him. Um, Christophe, um, you should be able to unmute yourself, I think. There you go. Oh, yeah, I was just wanting to come back to Milton's question. Um, there was this first Dirichlet form you wrote, which you said is, is the wrong Dirichlet form, or it's not really a Dirichlet form. But I mean, uh -huh. is it, isn't it the Dirichlet form of the continuous time global dynamics? It's okay. So, on the thing is that on Rn or on a manifold, you basically, if you do the Langevin dynamics, you have a drift, but the covariance, the variance term is always isotropic. And then you always get, you know, a Dirichlet form like this. But on the discrete hypercube, it's just, I mean, there is no reason to have something isotropic. May, maybe, maybe this may be a good way to convince you that this cannot be true is for example, if nu is just supported on points where the parity ah, nu is, is an, even. Yeah, okay, so nu is an arbitrary measure. Okay, okay. I thought nu yeah, was yeah, yeah, just yeah, product yeah. of the only right, one half. Right, that right, was right. confusion. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm stupid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. That was the, yeah, of course. Sorry about that. Anybody else? In that case, um, let's break until 10 past um, and we'll pick it up again then. Thank you very much. Great. Okay, so let's... Uh, good. So 
this theorem basically gives L2, which is not hard to say that it also implies L1. Ah, somehow I think there's a, this is, it's very lagging. Hold on. Can you see my laser pointer? Something is, uh, hold on, something is not working so well. Okay, maybe this is better. Can you see me writing? Uh, we got the yeah, same problem. Yeah. Yeah, 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 something. Okay, hold on. I'll I'll just uh, open the Zoom session again. Okay, my iPad is connected. Sorry about it. No problem. Uh, I'm gonna have to re-host your. What's your iPad called again? Ah, yeah. So in, I need the permission again. It's in a huge list now. What's it called? Yeah, it's Ronan something. Uh, how do I know what? Ah, yeah. It just says it's just my name. My my first and then my last. Uh, I, I see it as the very last square. When I go to the rightmost screen, I see it as the very like last can, square on the bottom right. Now? Can you share now? Let's see. No, it says only the host can share. I see Ronan already and your your co-host, so there must be another Ronan in here. Yeah, yeah, there should be two. One is my laptop and the other is uh, the iPad, which I just had to disconnect and then connect again. There it is, I've got it. It's right at the end, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There you go, I think it knows it was an iPad. Okay, good, I can do it. You got it. Start broadcast, let's see, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I think it's fine now. Okay, so what we saw is basically a theorem that implies L1 and L2, and it doesn't need any condition for this, but L1 and L2 are, are kind of weak. If, for example, we think of the measure uh, can you see me writing? Ah, bummer. What's going on? Should I um, something weird here? Yeah, maybe I should try to. Let me just to try to connect to the internet via mobile hotspot. Maybe it'll help, even though my connection is good, so I don't know. Sorry about this, everyone. Not sure what's going on. Let's 
So I'm just going to stop recording so that we can um, okay. pretend this never happened. <laughs>